Good morning and welcome to the Flight Day 9 Mission Status Briefing. Atlantis' crew is in their final full day in orbit, and here to tell us about that, we have the lead STS-132 Shuttle Flight Director, Mike Serafin. We'll start with opening remarks and then take questions. Mike? Thank you, Brandy. Day 9 of the uh, STS-132 mission represents a welcome shift in the flight of Atlantis to the International Space Station. Today, uh, the crew completed all of their primary mission objectives uh, with the return of the integrated cargo carrier and the six old batteries from the uh, Port 6 location on the International Space Station's uh, um, power uh, channel. So we've got the integrated cargo carrier back in the payload bay. We've got three very successful spacewalks under our belt. And uh, the uh, ROSFET module has been installed on the International Space Station. So now the mission shifts to returning Atlantis home, uh, hopefully uh, mid next week. Um, the uh, robotics workstation and all the robotics that uh, we worried about leading into this mission uh, were just uh, handled in an exceptional manner by the crew of Atlantis as well as the crew of the International Space Station. Coming into this mission, we talked about nine of the 12 days of this mission uh, were populated with very uh, heavily integrated and choreographed robotics activities. Uh, today, the, uh, the crew of Atlantis and the International Space Station uh, took a few moments to uh, complement the uh, folks that helped plan all the robotics on this mission, as well as uh, the folks that uh, built and delivered the cupola and the robotics workstation associated with it. And uh, I'll, I'll just second their words uh, that all of that uh, was done in an outstanding manner. Uh, Canada Arm 2 performed in a fantastic uh, fashion. It was all over the exterior of the International Space Station, this mission. It was uh, reaching down into the payload bay to remove cargo uh, as well as put it back. Uh, it uh, moved from the center of the truss back to the Russian segment over to the uh, far port side of the truss and then back to the center of the International Space Station. And again, uh, it was just an outstanding piece of machinery and uh, the man and machine interface that uh, supported it at the Cupolo and the Cupolo Robotics Workstation uh, just uh, worked in a, in a fantastic fashion during the mission. Uh, the afternoon, uh, today on the ninth day of the mission, the crew has some off-duty time. Uh, their last opportunity to take a break before uh, they start uh, bringing Atlantis home. Um, tomorrow, they're going to start with the uh, final transfer activities and get uh, the last remaining cargo off of the International Space Station that they plan to return in Atlantis's mid-deck in cargo uh, storage area. Uh, they'll transfer the uh, suits that they use to perform their uh, spacewalks on uh, back into Atlantis and uh, will perform a, uh, a final verification and make sure all the science and transfer items are back across the hatch and ready for return. Uh, around midday, they'll uh, close hatches, perform some leak checks, and then uh, if all goes as planned, we'll undock Atlantis from the International Space Station at around 1022 Central tomorrow. Uh, following undock, uh, the pilot Tony Antonelli will perform a, a one-lap fly around, a full 360-degree uh, rotation around the exterior of the International Space Station uh, at a range of four to 600 feet. And uh, we should get some outstanding views of the International Space Station for engineering data, as well as uh, a good view of the uh, ROSVET module that was recently installed. Uh, today, the crew also spent some time performing a, a variety of science experiments. Uh, they did some measurements uh, with an experiment called Spinal, where they uh, measured their uh, spinal growth uh, over the course of the mission uh, and just did that in a, a seating and a standing position. Uh, both the, all the six crew members from Atlantis as well as the uh, crew members from the uh, U.S. segment on the International Space Station provided uh, measurement data uh, that will be used to uh, help design future spacecraft. Uh, there were also a couple of other experiments that were performed today and uh, some of the cold stowage uh, that was taken from the freezer on board the International Space Station was put into a freezer on the uh, mid-deck of Atlantis. Tomorrow, uh, uh, again, we'll undock and then uh, following uh, the Flight Day 10 activities, we'll press into a uh, normal uh, orbital debris inspection uh, series of uh, sweeps with the orbiter boom on the 11th day of the mission and then we'll put away the uh, shuttle's robotic arm and the boom for a final time and that'll wrap up all the robotics on the mission. Uh, the uh, International Space Station is much better off at this point for the uh, crew of Atlantis for having been there. Uh, right now they're in the process of transferring some 70 pounds of oxygen for metabolic use by the crew of uh, the International Space Station. Uh, we've run into uh, a, a small hurdle associated with transferring some of that into the high pressure gas tanks 
the uh, um, oxygen transfer system uh, has a, a small hiccup in it that the engineering team is off working. Um, we've also transferred 10 pounds of nitrogen from the uh, shuttle into uh, the high pressure tanks on the International Space Station and 1,200 of 1,300 pounds of water uh, from Atlantis are now on the International Space Station. The final 100 pounds will be transferred tomorrow prior to undocking. Again, uh, a lot of cargo has gone across the hatches and uh, folks will just wrap that up tomorrow. The, uh, the crew of Atlantis will wrap that up tomorrow. Um, on board the International Space Station, the uh, ROSVET module, uh, they're in the process of uh, integrating that with the overall um, uh, systems on board the International Space Station, uh, working with the, the Mission Control Center in Moscow. The hatches have been open for about a day and a half now. There was uh, some report of uh, metal shavings and uh, some other debris uh, from when the module was put together and manufactured and some of the, the uh, cargo stowage was added to it. The crew has uh, been uh, basically cleaning the uh, air inside the module by running some fans and allowing that uh, uh, particulate material to get caught in some filters in the, uh, in the ROSVET module. And uh, once they've uh, made sure that the, the vast majority of those particulates are uh, cleaned out of the atmosphere, we plan to hook up some ducting either later today or tomorrow uh, with the rest of the, uh, the International Space Station, in particular the Zarya module, to ex uh, exchange air between those two modules. And uh, that'll uh, lead to some final uh, stages of integrating ROSVET with the International Space Station. So with that, uh, the mission is proceeding very well. All, both the crews are, uh, are happy and healthy and uh, looking forward to a uh, final closure of this joint mission tomorrow. And uh, I'd be happy to take any questions. Okay, we'll start with questions here in the room. And then I think we have a couple of reporters on the phone bridge as well. You can state your name and affiliation before your question. That'd be great, thanks. Hi, Robert Perlman with space.com and collectspace.com. Um, you mentioned normal late inspections. Is the plan to follow the regular streamlined procedure or will there be any additional imagery collected based on missing areas um, on the early inspections? We uh, spent some time over the last uh, week reviewing all the uh, inspection imagery and uh, our plan is to perform the normal uh, abbreviated late inspection procedure. There are some areas that uh, the procedure is the same procedure that we normally run on the second day of the mission, and then there are basically some cutouts in there where we skip a series of the tile, um, but do all of the reinforced carbon on, the, on Atlantis, and uh, we're gonna skip the tile surveys and just do the reinforced carbon surveys as we would on any other mission. Um, we've convinced uh, ourselves as a team through all of the uh, launch imagery, uh, that uh, we've recovered via the solid rocket boosters and recently, as well as the uh, standard launch imagery, the wing leading edge sensors, the uh, standard flight day two inspection that we, or the Delta flight day two inspection that we got via the uh, digital camera on the orbiter boom sensor system, the rendezvous pitch maneuver images, and then the images obtained during the first spacewalk that uh, Atlantis and its tile are ready to go. And we just need to do the uh, standard orbital debris inspection on, uh, on the 11th day of the mission using the, uh, the boom and the, the uh, pan and tilt uh, sensors out there, the laser dynamic range imager. So again, uh, we're just gonna go ahead and proceed with the, the normal uh, inspection uh, for orbital debris after we undock. Thanks, and uh, and you mentioned the fly around um, I, I, that does collect imagery of the of the International Space Station. But given that this is possibly Atlantis's last flight, have the station crew members been given any instruction to try to capture Atlantis um, as well, just for aesthetic reasons um, and historical reasons? Thanks. We always uh, capture uh, the shuttle departing from the International Space Station, and we haven't been uh, providing any, or we haven't. Uh, found a need to provide any special uh, images of Atlantis. Uh, we will capture Atlantis uh, via uh, cameras from the windows as well as the external cameras on uh, the International Space Station and I'm sure we'll have some great footage of that and uh, we look forward to that after, uh, or after undock and during the fly around sequence. Hi, Philip Sloss with nasaspaceflight.com. Um, on the, on the uh, oxygen transfer uh, to the high pressure gas tanks, um, how much uh, how much has been transferred so far out of the 70 pounds that you were talking about, and um, uh, how how does that transfer affect your uh, consumables margins for the orbiter um, after undock? Any uh, consumables that we're unable to transfer 
to the International Space Station would just augment the consumables margin that we already have on board Atlantis. So right now we've got uh, roughly a day of margin above uh, the, the two uh, extension days that we normally protect after undock. So we actually have three extension days worth of capability. So uh, anything that we're unable to transfer to the International Space Station would be above the three days and it would, we would have to make up a lot of margin in order to get a fourth day. Um, right now we've transferred uh, just shy of 20 pounds uh, of the 70 that we plan to transfer to the International Space Station and uh, a group of engineers and, and uh, uh, specialists are off uh, reviewing the problem with the uh, oxygen transfer system and, and we expect them to, uh, to either have a plan for us this afternoon or basically just say that uh, we won't be able to resolve the problem here in the next day before we close hatches and, and Atlantis needs to depart, in which case we'll be able to get about half of the uh, planned amount uh, transferred to the International Space Station. Thank you. Okay, I think that's all in the room. So we'll start now with the phone bridge questions. Uh, at first is Charles Atkinson. Good morning, Charles Atkinson with SpaceLunchNews.com. Could you cover why there are three days between undocking and landing, unlike most flights there are two days? On uh, this particular mission, uh, prior to launch, we worked with the crew of Atlantis and uh, we, as a team, agreed that the best plan for the mission, given how heavily uh, choreographed and populated the mission was with three spacewalks and all the robotics uh, that, that we knew we had ahead of us, that uh, ideally what we would do was undock at the end of a day and then uh, allow the crew to sleep and then pick up the next day with the standard inspection activities. The following day, pick up with the standard uh, pre-entry checkouts, the uh, flight control system checkout and the communication systems checkout and cabin stowage, and then land the day after that. Um, in the past, we have closed hatches, undocked, and uh, done late inspection on one day, or closed hatches, gone into the uh, crew sleep cycle, and then undocked, and then done late inspection. And what that does is it creates a very long, intensive day for the crew um, for the late inspection day. And there are a lot of critical activities that go on. And, and again, just due to the amount of work uh, leading up to those events on this mission, the, the team felt the best uh, and most appropriate course of action was to undock um, basically three days before we land. And, and we've been able to maintain that plan. Uh, we haven't had any major contingencies come along during the mission. It would cause us to want to compress the, uh, the undocking to landing time frame. So we've got a little bit more timeline uh, available and a little bit more margin in the mission available to, to offload or uh, load level the uh, work after undocking. So uh, that was a, a welcome change that we made to the mission. Okay, thank you. And one final one. Uh, it, uh, have the six old batteries on the ICC. Were there any other cargo that was the ICC turned off? Your question was uh, kind of broken, but I think you asked, uh, was there any additional cargo returned on the integrated cargo carrier? And the answer is no. We're just returning the uh, six uh, old batteries off of the Port 6 truss, and uh, that's the only thing that is on the cargo carrier at this time. Okay, thanks so much. Okay, next up we have Irene Klotz. Thanks very much. Um, I was wondering if you had any more information about anything being transferred back um, to the, from the station to the shuttle in the mid-deck. Yeah, regarding uh, mid-deck transfer, uh, we have all of the uh, spacesuits that uh, we used on board uh, the International Space Station from its airlock. Uh, there's some uh, peripheral equipment that goes with the uh, suits. Um, there's a large number of uh, stowage items that uh, the International Space Station uh, program wants us to return, including some uh, uh, water processing and urine processing equipment, uh, some samples uh, of uh, both pre-processed and post-processed uh, water to just maintain baseline information here on the ground. Um, there's a lot of uh, just various trash items that the shuttle is able to return, uh, some uh, old discarded foam, some old clothing, uh, dry trash, and a number of other items. Um, we're also returning a large number of experiments uh, and uh, all the, uh, all the co cold stowage that we're able to out of the, uh, out of the freezers on board the International Space Station to uh, support the, uh, the laboratory uh, that the International Space Station is and make the best use of it. 
Thanks. And what does the uh, station use the pressurized um, oxygen and nitrogen for, please? The uh, International Space Station uses the uh, oxygen and nitrogen that we transfer uh, for uh, management of the atmosphere. The, you know, the space station uh, pressurized modules uh, provide a, a shirt sleeve living environment for the, uh, the astronauts and cosmonauts that live on board. Um, any oxygen or nitrogen that we send across either through the uh, hatches via what we call a stack repress, which just uh, over time, the, the pressurized volume tends to, tends to bleed down because you're either doing spacewalks and opening the hatch and just a small amount of the atmosphere bleeds out into the vacuum of space, or uh, you use it uh, just through uh, the crew members just breathing it in and then um, pulling it out of the atmosphere via your carbon dioxide removal assembly or other systems. Um, so it basically replaces some of that, um, or uh, it could be used for future spacewalks while the shuttle is not present. And uh, there are uh, high pressure oxygen tanks on board the International Space Station. When the crew members are in their suits, they, br they breathe pure oxygen in a, in a reduced pressure environment. So that oxygen goes from the high pressure tanks through an umbilical into the suits uh, to provide the, the oxygen necessary to do a spacewalk. Thank you. Okay, I think that was it on the phone bridge, and we have one more, one more question here in the room. Uh, hello, uh, Peter Aylward, Southern FM in Australia. Um, could you just talk a little bit about how well uh, Atlantis has, has performed thus far on, it, on what's likely to be its uh, final mission? And also, a kind of a personal question, as a uh, lead flight director for the shuttle, do you get an opportunity to uh, watch launches and landings at KSC, and are you planning to, to head over to KSC for this landing? Uh, Atlantis uh, has been a remarkable vehicle and, and is a remarkable vehicle that we have on orbit right now. We had a few minor glitches uh, earlier in the mission, uh, but those glitches weren't anything that the team uh, here on the ground or the astronauts uh, on board Atlantis and the International Space Station haven't been able to recover from. Uh, if you recall earlier in the mission, we had a problem with the, uh, the boom sensor and the ability to pan and tilt a camera and some sensors on the end of it. Uh, the team basically went out and, and did a quick and easy task via spacewalk. And, uh, you know, there are a few other uh, smaller glitches that have occurred throughout uh, this mission, but uh, Atlantis. Uh, being a well-designed and a well-engineered vehicle and just uh, having outstanding maintenance at the Kennedy Space Center uh, continues to perform extremely well. Um, and uh, we just uh, are grateful for that um, and, and know that we have the right folks working prior to launch and during the mission on, on uh, uh, her maintenance. Um, in terms of uh, the ability to, to watch the launches and landings, um, I, I did not have an opportunity to watch the launch in person. Um, my shift as a lead flight director typically starts some 14 to 16 hours after launch, and you know the launch site is at the uh, Kennedy Space Center in Florida, and my, uh, my job managing the uh, mission control team here in Houston, Houston uh, just doesn't afford much of an opportunity to, to go watch a launch, fly back, be rested and ready to go. For, uh, for the job and task that I have to do uh, uh, on the second day of the mission. Um, my job uh, as a lead flight director is done on late inspection day, which is the 11th day of the mission, and we're gonna land on the 13th day. And I do have an, uh, an opportunity to go to the landing, and uh, I very much look forward to uh, seeing Atlantis come home, uh, hopefully mid next week, uh, to the Kennedy Space Center. Um, I. Uh, had a, uh, a talk with the uh, flow director, Angie Brewer, prior to, uh, prior to the launch of Atlantis, and I promised I'd give her back uh, in the same condition that we got her, and, uh, and we've come very close to that, and I look forward to, uh, to greeting her and her team out at the Kennedy Space Center and uh, fulfilling that promise. Um, I, uh, I also look forward to greeting the crew of Atlantis when they get off the ship and uh, just, just being there to watch that happen. Okay, I think that was the last of the questions. So we'll go back now to live mission coverage. Uh, Atlantis' crew, of course, is in their off-duty period at this point. They'll be going to sleep at 3.50 p.m. Central Time, and then we'll begin playing the flight day highlights for the day at the top of every hour from then until crew wake up at 11.50 p.m. tonight. Uh, they'll be getting ready for undocking tomorrow, which is scheduled for 10.22 a.m., which will be after the joint crew news conference at 5.25 a.m., and after their farewell ceremony at 7.10 a.m. Of course, you can keep up with all of this at www.nasa.gov. Thanks so much.